and with joy and enthusiasm, um, um, that's, that's a lot, that speaks a lot deeper and it speaks volumes about the person. So in this Mishnah, it's actually one of the only Mishnahs, one of the only tractates that doesn't have um, commentary uh, of the Talmud on it. So I'll explain to you what that means. Um, the Mishnah itself is actually very short. The Mishnah was written rather cryptic. On a five-line Mishnah, it takes around 10 pages of Talmud to discuss it and analyze it and um, deepen and, and clarify the meaning of this cryptic Mishnah. So most of the Talmud, there's 63 volumes, tractates of the Talmud. Almost all of them have very lengthy Mish uh, Talmud discussion around each Mishnah. This tractate is pretty unique and particular that there is actually no Talmud discussion beyond the Mishnah because the Mishnah itself is very clear and very um, uh, beautiful as it is. It doesn't take much uh, Talmud to discuss it and, and clarify it. Yet, while there's no Talmud analyzing it, there's hundreds, if not thousands, of beautiful commentaries that were written over the years, from 2,000 years ago when the Mishnah was authored, to current day, there's always Mish um, uh, beautiful commentaries that are explaining and um, deepening the, the meaning behind each Mishnah. One last thing, just as we are about to begin the first Mishnah, um, uh, it's a beautiful, there's many commentaries explaining the title of this Mishnah. It's called Pirkei Avot, which means ethics of the fathers, ethics of the parents. Avot is our parents. And why is it called the ethics of our parents, of our fathers, Avot? So one commentary is because we learn many things from our teachers but our parents and our grandparents are the ones we learn how to be a mensch. How to be a mensch and how to have the right ethics. We learn from our parents and our guides and our, our grandparents. To be behaving properly, to have a refined character, to be caring and to be sensitive and to be loving and thinking about those around us. I guess that's how the definition of a mensch, we get that from our parents. So, and that's one of the commentaries of why uh, it's called Ethics of Our Parents, Ethics Pirke Avot. And um, we also study this particularly in the summer months from many have the custom to study it in the six weeks, in the six Shabbats that take place between Passover and Shavuot. Shavuot is exactly seven weeks after. Um, after Passover, but that gives us six uh, Shabbats in between. So during these six Shabbats, we study the six chapters of this tractate every week, discussing and working on a different chapter. So this week begins chapter two of Pirkei Avot, and that's what we're, we're going to be analyzing today. So to begin, I'm actually going to be sharing our screen and um, just to read the text of the Mishnah, and then I'll come back to our video in order that we could discuss it. And if anyone obviously has comments or understandings of the Mishnah, I'd love to hear it. Um, we, we could learn from each other. And okay, everyone could hear me, I think, to, still. Okay, great. So the first Mishnah, before we begin it, I, what I want to try to do before most of the Mishnahs that we're going to be studying is give you a little bit of the background of the author of this particular Mishnah. And um, every Mishnah has a different author, a different person teaching this Mishnah. And uh, giving you a little bit of the color behind the person, it really gives you um, um, uh, some great meaning and understanding um, uh, the value of the Mishnah. So the first Mishnah we're going to be studying was authored by someone who was simply called, in this Mishnah, he's called simply Rebbe. His name is Rebbe, which means teacher. And he, out of all the great rabbis of the Talmud, there was only one person who was titled Rebbe. Oh, hold on a second. Uh, Peter, is that you? Uh, let's unshare. Um, yeah, I'm hold on a second. with the controls. I haven't quite... Uh, no problem. Uh, 
to go. No problem. We'll just bring back. Uh, I'll help you. Sorry about that. Oh, okay, sorry about that. Everyone can see me again? Okay, everyone's back. You can see me? Okay, great. Um, so back as I was saying, there was only one rabbi in the entire time of the Talmud over a span of hundreds of years, but he was actually called by the title Rebbe. Rebbe means teacher or rabbi, and that was his name. His real name was Rabbi Yehuda. His name was Rabbi Judah. And he was the prince. He was known as Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi. He was the leader of the prince of his generation. Another title he was known as is Rabbeinu Hakadosh, which means the holy rabbi. And all those were his titles, Rabbi or Rabbeinu Hakadosh. He was the leader of the time of the Jews um, during the, the period um, after the destruction of the temple. And what he saw, he did something that literally changed the entire landscape of Judaism changed history of Judaism. Until his generation, writing any of the Torah was actually forbidden. It was actually forbidden from the times of Moses to write anything down. It was called the oral law. Besides for the text of the Torah that Moshe himself wrote, it was called the written law, the scripture. Other than that, it was entirely forbidden to write it down. It was called only the oral law and was passed from teacher to student. He came along and what he saw there was actually a prohibition against teaching. People were being um, sentenced to death for simply teaching Torah. It became dangerous and forbidden. And what he saw was no one's studying Torah anymore. It's going to be forgotten. All those teachings that the teachers have, and they're not relaying it over, Torah will be forgotten from the Jewish people. So he did something that was very, very controversial. And he decided he's going to actually write down the oral Torah. And one of, another reason why he wrote it is because there became many debates and arguments of the law. People were saying in this city it was like this, and that city was like that. There was no universal um, uh, anchor for people to have the Torah because everyone was just studying from whatever they were able to get. So he needed to unify the entire teachings of the Torah. And he codified all of it, and he collected it, and he wrote what later became known as the Mishnah. It was an extremely controversial thing. Because Moshe himself, Moses, said it was forbidden to write it down. And here he comes, and he's writing it down. So he's credited to actually preserving Judaism. Um, just to give you an idea to what extent it was forbidden, he was actually born on the date that Rabbi Akiva was killed. Rabbi Akiva was the generation before him. He was, we read about him on Yom Kippur, which was actually the date of his death, where the Romans literally tortured him to death. And on the day of his death, on that same Yom Kippur, this young child was born who later became the one to collect all the teachings of Rabbi Akiva and his colleagues and put it down in a book called the Mishnah. Rabbi Yehuda, this author, he was the leader of his generation. He was the son, he was from the family of Hillel, who has some great statements of the Mishnah. He was the great-grandson of Hillel. His father's name was Rabbi Shimon, the son of Gamliel. Rabbi Shimon was, ben Gamliel was actually the leader before him uh, that experienced. He was the leader during the time Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans. Uh, one of the re unique reasons that Rabbi Yehuda was able to author the Mishnah is, was because he became friendly during his time. He actually became friendly with the emperor, with the Caesar. The Caesar's name in Hebrew, his, the Caesar's name was Antoninus. That's how he's referred to in the Talmud. In uh, English, it would be Antony. And he was the Caesar of the time. And they were actually friendly. To the point where it says, this was actually, it's a pretty tragic part. But Antony would love to have debates and discussions with the rabbi, with Rabbi Huda, the leader. But he couldn't show anyone that he was discussing Torah or discussing any religious discussion with um, with the rabbi, so they had a private alleyway that they would meet each other through, and he would go with guards, 
But after the discussion, this Caesar, after visiting the rabbi in his home, he would actually kill the guards so that they don't tell anyone else where he was. So every day, he would go through two guards. Just to show you his brutal type, but yet he still wanted to have discussions with this rabbi. Um, it says when he died, humility ceased from the world. He was a man of incredible humility. Um, anyway, let's, that's what the Talmud says about him. Um, he also lived with a lot of physical pain. He was extremely wealthy, but yet lived very, very painful, uh, physical, physical, physically painful life. Um, it says that he was so wealthy that his stable boy, the Talmud says, was more wealthy than the king of Persia. So he definitely didn't pay minimum wage, and um, he was uh, uh, definitely uh, wealthy. All right, without further ado, I will be sharing my screen. You'll be able to see it in just a moment, and we'll read the Mishnah together. Okay, uh, let's see. Jolie, are you able to read? Are you able to see the screen? If I could unmute you, or you want to unmute I am. Okay. I am. All right, if you don't mind, let me just tell everyone exactly where we are. One second, please. Um, I'll put a spotlight. The second mission starts from right here, where it says, Rabbi Yehuda Anasi says? Yes. Um, so you could, for now, skip the below the line. So basically, go straight okay. from here to the next page. If that All right. Go for it. Okay. Rabbi Yehuda Anasi says, which is the proper path in life that a person should choose for himself? any path that is honorable and beneficial for himself and is also honorable and beneficial to other people. Be as careful with commandment, I'll say that again, be as careful with a commandment that you think is not so important as you are, hmm. with a commandment that you think is very important. Oh, as you are, oh, I see, okay. Be as careful with a commandment that you think is not so important as you are with a commandment that you think is very important because you do not know how much reward is given for different commandments or how important they are to God. Compare any expenses or loss of money that might be caused when you do a commandment with the reward that you will receive for doing it and compare the temporary physical gain from a sin with the loss that it will cause. I think I need more scrolling. I yep, I was waiting for you to be ready. Okay. <clears throat> Consider the three things listed below and you will not come to commit a sin. Know what is happening above you in heaven. Hold on one second. Okay, perfect, continue. All right. One, there is an eye that sees everything. Two, there is an ear that hears everything. Three, all your deeds are written and recorded in a book. Uh-oh. Wow. Am I done reading? Uh, yeah, that's the first Mishnah. We'll give everyone <laughs> just uh, a moment or two just to reflect on the Mishnah. I'll just pull it back up. Uh, which is the proper path. And then we'll, if anyone wants to um, chime in something, I'll also be, be sharing some um, practical points of this Mishnah. We'll highlight each part and discuss it a little bit. Uh, there's a lot of points, obviously, in the, in the Mishnah. So we'll just give everyone a moment to see it, uh, reflect on it, and then we'll share it. Can I reflect? Yep, I'm ready. Okay. Go for it. okay. I, as I was reading this, it was really stunning. This is so dense. I mean, this has everything in it. This is like the Ten Commandments right here. <laughs> you, you could unpack this for a universe, yep. uh, you know, for, forever. But the, the point that really stood out for me that is so universal and so eternal and so contemporary, it all seems to be, but one thing is it says, where it says, compare the temporary physical gain from his sin with the loss that it will cause. It's so simply stated and so fundamental a foundation that it's just, I don't know, I'm just impressed. It's just stunning. It's like a, it's like a roadmap that really <laughs> makes it very, it's a guideline because we are tempted toward physical gain. Beautiful. We're tempted toward the, the hot foot Sunday. We're tempted toward the adultery. We're tempted toward the drugs mm -hmm. and just to have this 
Not that it, not that it's magical, but just to go, this is the measure. Think about this. Beautiful. And that's all. Nice. Thank you. Yeah, and anyone else who wants to uh, share something, that was, that was beautiful, Jolie, you're welcome to unmute yourself um, and, and share. As we go along, I'll, I'll share some as we go through each one. Uh, the first statement of Rebbe, um, he goes, there's obviously parts to it. And he says the first thing, the first thing he's saying, what's the path you should choose? Something that is honorable for you, beneficial for himself, but also honorable and beneficial to other people. And um, a lot of times a person, when they're taking on mitzvahs and they're doing things that are spiritually beneficial for themselves, it's risking a relationship that they have with other people. You have to make sure that what you're taking on is also, you have to find a way not to refrain from what you're doing, but you have to way, find a way to include uh, people around you that they could also feel um, in, um, uh, part of it and, and included in it. And it's done in a honorable way um, that is with, with, uh, with them involved. Another part, uh, this is from a commentary from the Bartonura, who was an Italian rabbi from the 15th century. And he writes a commentary along the Mishnah. He says part of this path is um, taken from the Hebrew word. He analyzes it. And he says you should actually, actually look for the middle path. Either the middle path is the path you should choose. The proper path is the middle path, which means anytime you're in an extreme in society, it can cause, um, um, it's, it's, it's harmful, it's not good. For example, a person can be either too stingy, which is not good. You, on your hand, you're able to amass a fortune for yourself, so it's beneficial to you, but it's not being beneficial to others. On the other hand, you could be too generous and being very beneficial to others, but not being beneficial to you, not, not putting yourself in a proper place. So therefore, this Bartonura says, choosing the middle path is an important middle ground that you have to find. And the same is with everything, is to find the perfect middle balance. Um, another one, uh, this is from the Midrash Shmuel. He says that if you have a choice between doing one of two mitzvahs, a mitzvah that is between you and God, or let's say putting on tefillin, or a mitzvah that is between you and another person, you should perform, perform the mitzvah between you and another person because that's a benefit to you, but also a benefit to others. Um, Oh, and one last beautiful commentary. This is from the Rebbe. He actually takes the first line. I'm just going to highlight it again. Um, the first line in the Hebrew, just to say, tell you the literal words, it says, what is the right path? He actually learns those words itself as an answer, a, a question and an answer. The question is, what should you, what's the right path to choose? And the answer is, by choosing. Never take a path that is being told to you what you have to be doing. He learns what is the right path that a person should choose. He, not, he doesn't, the Rebbe doesn't learn that as a question. He learns that as an answer. The right path is a path that you chose for yourself, not a path that was told to you that you have to follow it. So in terms of our Judaism, what's very practical in there, you know, let me just um, unshare the screen here for a moment. Um, okay, everyone can see me. Um, what's very practical in, in learning this is that it's not just about going down the right path, it's making sure the right path is a path that I am choosing for myself. It's a path that I am, I am on with my own joy and my own enthusiasm. And Judaism has to be done that way. It can't be a Judaism that is just being forced on me and I have to find it. It has to be something that's chosen by me and it's my path that I'm searching for. Um, and on the, the next part that Jolie was saying, is about being careful with a minor mitzvah and a major mitzvah. It's very interesting because it's hard. Are you able to put a weight to a mitzvah? Is a mitzvah weighable? You have a bigger mitzvah and you have a smaller mitzvah. I mean, to my children, we tell them. We, if they help someone, we say that was a very big mitzvah. So is there such a thing as a small mitzvah versus a big mitzvah? And it's something really to reflect on. It's hard for me to answer it, but from this Mishnah, it would definitely seem that they're equal. Take a light mitzvah and take a, a stringent mitzvah and realize that they're equal. The, the story I always like to share on this 
is from the 15th century rabbi, Rabbi David ben Zimra, who was actually a chief rabbi. Um, he was based in Egypt. And in the early 1500s, near his death, he was actually confronted with a question that we have the um, compilations of correspondence that um, took place between him and Jewish people across the world. And there was a Jew who uh, was imprisoned. I think this was in Portugal. He was in, um, he was, he found himself in a, in a dungeon somewhere in Europe. I think it was Portugal, but I'm not certain. And um, after several years, he was granted by the warden one day, uh, one day a year out of 365 days, he was given one day that he could live like a free man, which means he gets to check out in the morning, but he has to return that evening. He gets one day, he could live like a free person. And the warden didn't care what day it was, it's just one day a year. So he was confronted with the dilemma, what day should I be choosing? He had a choice and he didn't know which to choose. And therefore he actually wrote to this rabbi, he was known as the Radvaz, Rabbi David ben Zimra, asking him what day should I choose? And the answer Rabbi David ben Zimra gave was actually a, a stunning answer. Uh, he said, you should choose the next available day because there's no such thing as a more important day than another because even if it's Yom Kippur and there's great mitzvahs to do on that day, that doesn't give it any more um, uh, of significance than what you could do today. Meaning every day has the power of those same 24 hours to fulfill it to its maximum. Don't go and weigh mitzvahs of one day over another. Um, yes, let me, uh, um, Debbie, I'll help unmute you. Unless, could you unmute yourself? Or you want me to unmute you? I'm unmuted. Oh, perfect, go ahead, yeah. Um, so I want to go back to what you were talking about, um, choosing our path. Sure. Um, and there's a, a couple of things. One, obviously right now, none of us are on the path that none of us have chosen this path that we're currently on, this mandated seclusion. Yeah. Um, number one. And number two is, um, aside from our current state of affairs, you may not, you may be in a situation where um, you have to choose a path due to circumstances, which may not necessarily be the path that you want to choose. But when having to make a choice, simply not choosing number one is making a choice, but you might be having to make a choice different than the path that you would normally want to choose. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. You, uh, elaborate a little more. Yeah, uh, especially the first point is very telling. Uh, the first that resonates a lot. You're right. None, none of us chose this path, but um, we we could, even though it wasn't chosen. But once we're on it, we have to make sure we find the be the best um, way to live on that path and to find the joy in in it somehow. I don't I don't have the full answer to how to do it. But you're right. We're we're on this path. We're all in it together. Um, and it's kind of the story of my life is just having to make do with and make the best of, mm -hmm. of the situation or the path uh -huh. I'm having to deal with, which is not necessarily what I would choose to be doing anyway. Yeah, yeah, well, all of us have choices, have limited options in our choices. We don't have infinite choices, right? Yeah, so it's, I think to me, that's what it means is pick the path from the choices you have and the ones that you could shape yourself maybe, but nobody has complete control of their path or their life. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you, Adrian. Well said. Thank you. Um, let's see. Um, All right, I'm going to go to the next part of the Mishnah. Uh, just one more part. Towards the end of the Mishnah, Jolie, you, it stood out when you said, like, um, there's an eye, that, uh, an eye that sees, an ear that hears, and everything is written in, uh, in the records, right? Was that the expression? Permanent that, record, Rabbi. <laughs> and all the deeds are recorded in the book. So... Um, there's in, in general there's a there's um we all know there's something that's called musar 
which is kind of words of rebuke to inspire you on the right path. And there's also chasidut, which is uh, inspiring also on the right path. Both are different uh, um, ways of getting there, but the goal is the same, to inspire us in our ways. But in, de- in general, when it comes to meditation or philosophies of how to inspire, there's one of two ways of how it's done. One is through meditation and contemplation on the greatness of God. And another is on realizing how lowly we are. Both are able to bring you to a stature of realizing a, a greatness in God, but either it's because I'm so low and God is so great, or it's really focusing on the greatness of God. And I think in this, in this Mishnah, the inspiration is re- to reflect on um, that God is watching over us and he, he's able to be a part of every part of our life and he cares for everything in us. Um, and we have a relationship with him that we have to keep. Um, just then one last one, and, and this one is an important one. It's, it's one of the favorites. In Hasidus, a lot of times what they do is they take simple words of a Mishnah, but they find in those words itself an answer to a powerful question. And over here in Hebrew, the wording of our Mishnah is, you should know, da ma lemaila You should know what is above you. That was the opening uh, last section of the Mishnah. It says, you should know what is above you. An eye that hears, an eye that sees, an ear that hears. So the Hasidic masters, they teach us, da, you should know, lemaila, what is above? Mimach, it's from you. So instead of it's just reading, know what is above you, he, the Hasidic masters read it, know what is above is coming from you, which means your actions don't only have an effect on you, your action affects everything that's going on in the heavenly realms and in the spiritual world. It's all coming from how you're reacting to things and how you're behaving and how, what you're thinking. It has a very positive or God forbid negative effect on not only ourselves and our surroundings, but even to the most spiritual of worlds, it also has a, a significant effect. All right, we'll go on to the next Mishnah. Um, let's see, who's next? Let's see, my mother-in-law. Well, uh, my, you're, at least on my screen, you're next in the video. Uh, would you, uh, let me, I uh, can unmute you. Turn this. All right, my, I think you're unmuted. Well, maybe not, hold on one second. There you go, yep. Um, would I be able to give you that second Mishnah, which is, I went a little bit too far, uh, towards the top where it says number two? Are you able to see that? Um, you know, let me scroll. I could actually zoom in a little bit. That's probably easier. Is that good? Yeah, that's better. <laughs> okay. Rabban Gamliel, the son of Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, says, Torah learning goes well with having a job. Because working hard at both of them will keep you away from sin. And any Torah learning that is not accompanied by work will eventually end, and that will cause a person to sin. Whoever works with a... And a Hold on a second, I'm just going to scroll to the next page. Whoever works with the community should work with them for the sake of heaven and not to receive honor, because if they do so, the merit of their ancestors helps them succeed in their communal work, and their righteousness will last forever. Although the person was helped by the merit of the ancestors, God says, I will give you great reward as if you had accomplished it all by yourself. Beautiful. What a Mishnah. Once again, I'll... uh, I'll, uh... I'll be quiet for a moment if anyone wants to reflect. The Mishnah 2, if it's, everyone's able to see it, I just put it up, you're able to kind of see the whole thing. Um, I'll be silent for some moments, and anyone who wants to pop in with uh, insight on here, you're welcome to. Shall we baby girl? All right, let's see. Oh. 
Okay, so one of the commentaries, I'm looking here in a book full of commentaries, um, just on one section, I'm just gonna highlight the section um, that, that really resonates. It says over here, and any, wor any Torah learning that is not accompanied by work will eventually end, and that will cause a person to sin, which means if a, a work, the, we, we, our Torah study always needs to be followed up with work. We can't just expect to rely on God with our Torah study and that money and food will just come to my home. A person is also expected to work. In fact, in the Torah, it says six days you shall work and on the seventh day you shall rest, which means in order to truly rest on the seventh day to fulfill the mitzvah of Shabbat, we also have to work for six days. We have to do whatever we can um, in, a, in a job at whatever abilities and whatever opportunities we have. But uh, the Baal Shem Tov, the founder of the Hasidic movement, he wrote a book called Keser Shem Tov, And he explains that work, any Torah study, it has to be followed up with work. Over here, a real workout, he says, is um, uh, the workout of loving another person, of showing kindness, compassion, and reaching out to another person. He says, if you want your Torah to count, if you want your Torah to stick, you need to also be there with Ahavat Yisrael, with love, with a true workout to be there for another. If a person is just going to seclude himself and work on himself and not think about others, his Torah is not going to last in him if he's not working um, and seeing into it that other people have what they need as well. Uh, if you don't share it, you will lose it. As a, that's, how the Rebbe, um, that's how the Rebbe quotes it. So... Uh, there's a, a different discussions in the commentaries when it says Derech Eretz, which is the Hebrew word over here. I'll just highlight the Hebrew word. Um, whoops. Uh, the word of Rabbi Gamliel, he says the words Derech Eretz, which literally means the ways of the world. So most people translate Derech Eretz to mean work. You got to work. It's the way of the world, the path of the world. But Derech Eretz, the way, as a kid, if you get punished in school for having chutzpah, one of the assignments I was given as a kid is we had to write um, a, an expression from the Mishnah that says, Derech Eretz is, precedes Torah. Derech Eretz could also mean etiquette, manners, respect. That's the way of the world. So Derech Eretz, it, over here, the way the commentators explain it, it's not just finding a job or having a job. The Torah needs to work only if you have proper etiquette. If a person is becoming more religious or whatever else is happening, that they want to do this mitzvah, but they're um, rebuking other people and they're being obnoxious about what they're doing and they don't have the etiquette or the manners and sensitivity for those around them, um, your Torah is actually not going to last. It's not going to be, um, um, if it's not accompanied with etiquette, it's not going to be proper Torah study um, at the same time. Um, okay, anyway, I'm going to continue on. We'll go to the next mission. Uh, this is an important one. It's a very interesting one about government. Um, those in power. Uh, let's see. Uh, Thomas, would, are, I know Shira told me yesterday in our Tanya class that your audio wasn't working, but is it working now? Either way is fine. Yes, I'm. I'm on a. I'm on my computer. My oh, computer perfect. works. Oh, awesome! All right, are you able to see? I'll just highlight for you um, number three. I'll. I'll just zoom in a little bit, make it whoops bigger. Is that better? That's huge. Okay. <laughs> Beware of those in power because they befriend a person only for their own needs. They seem to be a friend when they're benefiting from a person, but they will not stand by a person and help him in his time of need. Wow. Should I continue? That's a beautiful Mishnah. It's a, just a reminder. Um, okay, yeah, let's, unless someone has what they want to say on it. Um, one story, Rabbi Dover, the second Chabad Rebbe, he was known as the Mittler Rebbe. He was the middle Rebbe because he was after his father, who was the elder Rebbe. Uh, he was shown a lot of respect in the eyes of the government. I mean, the government had respect for him and uh, would show him honor, but he was always unimpressed. And he would quote this Mishnah and, and say that they only befriend the person for their own needs. And eventually he, he had a tough with the government and he was also arrested 
and he died uh, from his weakness running away from the government. So um, it's just a very telling thing. Um, yeah, let's continue. Um, it's a, yeah, go ahead. It's a, this is a, in this mission is one of the most famous statements of Judaism, which is do not judge uh, your friend until you have reached this place. But so mm -hmm. well, let's do the whole mission and then we'll try to unpack it. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, Tommy. Want, yep. want me to go? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Rabban Gamliel would often say, treat God's will as though it were your as though it were your own will, so that he will treat your will as though it were his will. Set aside your will in favor of God's will, so that he will set aside the will of others in favor of your will. Hillel says, do not separate yourself from the community, community and ignore their needs. Stay on guard and do not be sure of your ability to withstand temptation until the day you die. Do not judge your friend until you're in his place and can fully understand what he's going through. Wow. Do not say something that is not easily understood, relying on the fact that it will be understood after more thought, because it might be misinterpreted. Do not say, I will learn Torah when I have free time, because you may never have free time. Mm. So the, this is an awesome mission. Again, I'll be quiet for 30 seconds. I'll let everyone reflect on it. And then whoever wants to unmute yourself, themselves, Thomas will give you first round, first dibs. But we'll be quiet. I'll be quiet for 30 seconds and let everyone read it and uh, concentrate on it or uh, meditate on it. Beautiful thing there. Okay, so for me, the one that stands out the most in this Mishnah is do not judge your friend until you are in his place and you can fully understand what he is going through. And, and the simple understanding is you're never in their place and you can never understand what they are going through. And therefore, you should never judge a friend or anyone. You shouldn't judge another person. Uh, the famous story to reflect on this is actually from the Talmud itself. One of the, the, um, one of the so we had the Mishnah, which I told you about. And then several hundred years later, with all the commentaries of the Talmud, in um, the third and fourth century is when the Talmud was fully compiled and the entire Talmud, the Encyclopedia of Jewish Knowledge, was sealed. It was, it was uh, made. One of the authors of the finale of the, of the Talmud, his name was Rabbi Ashi. And once he was dreaming in, a, in his dream, um, uh, a, a Jewish king, whose name was Menashe, visited him in his dream. And they had a discussion, a debate on a, a Torah topic. Now this Menashe was one of the worst kings to ever live. He forced and obligated each of his um, uh, subjects of the Jewish kingdom to serve idols. He was a horrible king. They banned anyone from going to Jerusalem. They closed all the roads off. And they forced them to serve idols. That was Menashe. He was a Jewish king. And Ravashi, in the course of their dream and conversation, Ravashi, impressed with the Torah knowledge of Menashe, said, how could it be that in your generation, Menashe lived several centuries prior, like 600 years prior. He asked him, how was it that in your time, you, you were so addicted to idolatry? What was it that was... And, and Menashe, the king, answered, that if you lived in my generation, this is his answer that's quoted in the Talmud. He told Ravashi, if you lived in my generation, you would have lifted the hem of your dress, of your robe, to run after me to the idol worship, uh, I, the, idol, the, the idol homes. Because it was something, you don't understand the intensity of temptation towards idols. Nowadays, it seems like who's running to an idol? But in those days, that was the temptation of the day. So uh, that's a story to explain that we can never understand what a person went through in their childhood, what a person is going through with employees at work, what a person is going through at home or anywhere. So we can never judge a person's way of, of speaking or if they're having a bad day. We don't know what's going on behind the scenes and therefore we can never judge them. Um, I see Debbie and go ahead. Yes. Oh, yes. Okay, so in contrast to what you're saying about judging, yeah. um, not being able to be in your friend's shoes, when 
um, <clears throat> when you have been in your friend's shoes and say experienced um, something, experienced the same experience that your friend is now experiencing, you're in the perfect position to be able to understand and then render care and compassion and comfort to that other person because you've experienced the same thing. And for that, I would, oh, go ahead, Jolie. Yep, did you want to add to that? I, I was going to say, yeah, Debbie, your point is well taken. And <clears throat> it's occurred to me many times, uh, you know, I never like the saying about, you know, God never gives you more than you can handle, or, you know, all this people applauding in the wings for your pain. Um, but on the other hand, we can see in this part of the tractate, the, a weird kind of a gift of wisdom, not, not that we ever wanted to have it, but when there is pain and when there is loss, that you can then kind of spread your care and love to other people because you have, you have that in your purse, you know, in your pocketbook. You can, you can take that out. You can empathize with them in a way that makes you a richer friend, a better community member. And Rabbi, in your case, any pain that your family experiences, unbelievably, horribly, something that, that expands your ability to touch us more. I, I mean, I'm not saying I want that to happen to you, God forbid, but I'm just saying, you know, that there are these things that are hard to manage in our lives um, add, to the, add to the purse of things we can take out and communicate with other people about. I, I like that more than somehow it's a blessing. Or, yeah. You know, I, that's hard to say. But anyway, so, and in this tractate, we really, we see that supported. Yeah, and I'm, I'm looking at the text. It, it seems to me that the judging over here is always in the negative. You can never, if a person is acting, uh, acting um, in a way that to you seems obnoxious, you could help them, but you shouldn't uh, judge them for what they're doing. You, you could rebuke them and guide them along the right path. That's, that's something else. But you should never judge in your heart and say, this person is, judging is wrong because you're, you're never in, you don't know what they went through in their childhood, et cetera. So therefore you can never judge. But in the positive, if you have an experience that you could add support, compassion, guidance, and experience to um, help someone in the positive, by for sure you should be there to help them. But in the negative, I think over here it's more the negative. If a person is doing something that you find um, uh, to be wrong, you can't judge them for it. You could help them and it's even a mitzvah to rebuke them if it's done the right way, but not to um, judge them for it. Uh, yeah, thank you, Debbie, for uh, bringing, clarifying that and bringing that up. Um, Can you clarify a little bit that first sentence about God's will and your will? I'm not following that. For yeah, that was, a, that was a tricky, yeah, thank you, Adrian. You know, let me um i'll just i was gonna comment on that one actually sure do you want that me to bring it would it be helpful if i brought it back up i'm not sure what's more convenient for everyone um let's let's let, let's bring it back up let's see what it means um treat god's will yep adrian do you have any thoughts on it or uh, or thomas did you want to share something on it now i was going to say that that was actually i mean i think the other paragraph that we've been talking about i think is i mean the other part of it is, is important too but i think what stood out for me in, in that first part of it is also reminds me of a quote by martin luther king i mean um and uh just because i was more familiar with that quote which is i cannot be everything that i ought to be if you're not if you're not everything that you ought to be and it kind of makes me think about that the interconnection between my will and um the will of someone else. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. That's a beautiful quote from Martin Luther King. And I definitely see parallels to this for sure. Um, I mean, I know this is refer referencing Hashem, of course, and Hashem's will, but it's kind of, kind of a similar idea that, um, let's see. Oh, it's uh, right I over think here. That, that it makes me just think of the interconnectedness there. Yeah, I like it. And I'm just looking over here. The Rebbe has a nice uh, commentary on this. Uh, what Rabbi, according to the Rebbe, what Rabbi Gamliel is instructing us is that we have to make sure if our will is transformed to be synonymous with God's will, once your will is on board, once your wills are, are connected, then your heart and your mind will follow suit. So if a person is looking to be inspired, you have to get the want in it, the will um, in it. Uh, the Rebbe brings an example. Um, a bribed judge the Rebbe takes as an example, 
a person, a judge who's being bribed, he sincerely is convinced that choosing that um, 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 uh, um, rendering a verdict to the side of the person who he was judged, he actually believes it's the right judgment. Because once the once the bribe is in place, his mind, his decision is created by his um, by by the will that he has to go to that side. So once his will is there, that's in the negative, meaning he's being bribed. So his will wants to be there. He'll find the mind and the heart to follow along. Um, but what the mission of Rabbi Gamaliel is saying is we have to find the will to be synonymous with God's will, and then God's will will be synonymous to yours, meaning God will have um, um, set aside the will of others in favor of your will. He will help you um, find the right will and other people following uh, your will. It's uh, yeah, very nice. Thank you. So it's talking about leadership in a sense also? Uh, the leadership to the point where we all have it, right? That, that is something that we all have to find within ourselves. Yeah, I think so. And one last thought, I think. Um, from, oh, let me see if someone's asking. Oh, I see Tessa trying to come. Hold on one second, everyone. Okay. Um, one let me last just ask real quick while, while yeah. you're doing that. Um, yeah. How how long is the class tonight? An oh, hour? An hour. We're going to be done in 10 minutes. Okay. I think we started at 7.35, so maybe 14 minutes, something like that. Okay. Um, do not separate uh, from Hillel. This is a beautiful quote. Do not separate yourself from the community. And I think that's a beautiful, um, 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 a beautiful understanding, realizing that being part of a community, it protects us, it guides us, it supports us, not only emotionally, but even it, it keeps us along the right path, knowing that other people are, are, are along together. Um, we hold certain standards together and you doing it together as a community makes it a lot easier for it to, be, to get done knowing that you have the support and you have the momentum of everyone around. And Hebrew, I'm just gonna um, circle the Hebrew word over here. Um, the Hebrew word for community is actually tzibor. I just wanna show it to everyone. Uh, right over here you have tzibor is the tzaddik, the bet, and the resh. Together it makes the word tzibor, which means community. Um, the hey over there is just a prefix to it, ha tzibor, but the tzibor is the main word. If you take that word, it actually spells out, it's an acronym of three Hebrew words, which is a tzaddik, a benani, and a rasha. Uh -huh. It's actually three Hebrew words that is the righteous, the regular, and the compromised type of person, meaning all three of them make up a community. A community is not only a bunch of righteous people, a community has all sorts. A community has everyone. And we could each, like Debbie was saying before, we could each learn from each other and experience that someone has, they're, they're in the right place to help and support someone who's going through it now. So, um, and the last I part is interesting, uh, when we have free time, I think a lot of us have free time now to be studying Torah, um, just an interesting uh, time to be reading that Mishnah. I really like the do not say something that is not easily understood. Ah, yes. How do you understand that, Adrian? Make sure it's easily understood for us. What do you mean? So the way I understand it is a person could try to look very wise by saying a very cryptic comment and expecting everyone to decipher it and uh, analyze it, but maybe it won't be understood in the right way. And therefore say it the correct way to begin with and don't say cryptically or in a riddle or in um in a uh, concise fashion make sure you're saying it in the most easily um uh, uh, the the way that's most easily understood so that it's it won't get misinterpreted okay we're going to skip a little bit i actually want to get to uh there's actually some such beautiful mishnas but um i'm just gonna it might make you dizzy i'm just gonna scroll down a little bit um if it's okay with everyone, this is more, just because I was actually excited, this is one of my favorite places to be in Israel, um, is in a place where this Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai lived. Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, he died at 120, just like his, uh, the leaders before him, Moses and Hillel, were some great leaders. They also died at the age of 120. That's where it became the very traditional way to say, may you live till 120. 
But Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai, he had many students, but here he compliments five of his outstanding students. The reason why um, um, I like having these, um, this Mishnah read and understood is because if you go to Tiberias, in Hebrew it's called Tiberia, which is in the north of Israel, uh, next to the Kinneret River, uh, the Kinneret Lake, Lake Kinneret, the Sea of Galilee, he's actually buried with these five students. Um, surround, um, their tombs are surrounding his. It's really a beautiful sight where you see the teacher and his five students being buried um, around him. So anyway, I'm just going to read it. Uh, let's see, did anyone else want to read? Let me just go down. Um, Adrian, would you like a chance to read? Oh, perfect. Let me unmute you. Tell me if you could. I think, Adrian, you're unmuted, but maybe you have to do it yourself. Oh, I guess I cannot hear you yet. Try again. There you go. Awesome. I'm going to mm -hmm. zoom in a little bit, and when you're done the page, I'll scroll down a little bit, but it might make okay, it Okay, so we're on nine. Yeah. Rabbi okay. Yohanan ben Zakkai had five special students. There were Rabbi, Rabbi Eliezer ben Hurkanus, Rabbi Yekoshua ben Kanania, Rabbi Yose the Kohen, Rabbi Shimon ben Netano, and Rabbi, Rabbi Eliezer ben Ara. He used to list their praiseworthy qualities as follows. Rabbi Eliezer ben Hurkanus is like a cemented tank that does not lose a drop of water because he does not forget anything. Rabbi Yehoshua ben Kanania, his mother is fortunate that she gave birth to such a son. Rabbi Yose the Kohen is a Hasid who does more than the law requires. Rabbi Shimon ben Netano is a person who fears sin. Rabbi Eliezer ben Arach is like a fountain that flows with ever-increasing strength because he always adds to his wisdom. Rabbi Yochanan would often say, if all the wisdom of the sages of the Jewish nation would be on one side of the scale, and the knowledge of Rabbi Eliezer, just scroll a little bit. Uh, you're up to here. Rabbi okay, Eliezer yeah. ben and, the, and the knowledge of Rabbi Eliezer ben Hurkanus would be on the other side. His knowledge would outweigh all of the all of theirs. Abba Shaul says a different version of the statement in Rabbi Yochanan's name. If all the wisdom of the sages of the Jewish nation would be on one side of the scale, including the wisdom of Rabbi Eliezer ben Hurkanus and the wisdom of Rabbi Eliezer ben Ara would be on the other side, his wisdom would outweigh all of theirs. Awesome. So there's a lot, to, uh, each one of these giants I have so much to share on them and their stories of their life and their death. But I actually would prefer, instead of it being more history, to actually see what they say, what is the best thing for a person to live by, and each five of them have a different opinion, and we'll see the choice of their teacher on it. Uh, let's see, Vivian, uh, no pressure at all. Let me know if you would like to sh um, read. Uh, I'll give you... Okay, can you oh, hear I, me? I could hear you. Perfect. Okay, sure what am I reading? Uh, Mishnah 10, are you able to see it? Yes. Perfect. Go for it. So Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai said to his students, go out and see which is the good way to which a person should adhere. What is the best thing that a person should strive to have in his life? Such a good student, question. I love it. I know, right? We ask that every day. The students came back with various answers. Rabbi Elizar says, looking at everything with a good eye, being generous and happy for others. Rabbi Yehoshua says, being a good friend to help and advise people. Rabbi Yosei says, being a good neighbor to positively influence your surroundings. Rabbi Shimon says, seeing and anticipating the results of events and actions before they occur. Rabbi Elazar says, having a good heart, having kind and positive feelings towards others. Rabban Yochanan ben Zakai then said to them, I prefer what Elazar ben Arak said to what the rest of you said, because what he said, having kind and positive feelings toward others includes all the other good qualities that you mentioned because it leads to them. He also said to them, go out and see which path is the bad path from which a person should keep far away. And Rabbi Eliezer says, looking at everything with a bad eye, being stingy and jealous of others. Rabbi Yeshua says, being a bad friend. Rabbi Yose says, being a bad neighbor. Rabbi Shimon says, being a person who does not realize that he will be unable to repay a loan, and so he borrows and does not pay back. Someone who borrows from a person and does not pay it back is? 
It's a beautiful mission. Yeah. Thanks so Wait much. for it. It's like someone borrowing from God. As it says in Psalms, a wicked person borrows and does not pay back. But God, who is righteous, acts graciously and gives the lender back his money. Now the borrower owes it to God. Rabbi Elazar says, having a bad heart, negative feelings towards others. Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai then said to them, I prefer what Elazar ben Arak said to what the rest of you said, because what he said, having negative feelings toward others, includes all the other bad qualities that you mentioned, because it leads to them. Each of these five stages said three things. Rabbi Elazar says- Hold on one second there, Vivian. Okay, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Just before we continue, there's already a lot that we've studied, and uh, yes. uh, let's just see. So what comes out is the teacher sides with uh, the opinion of Rabbi Eliezer. Uh, let's just get to that. Having a good heart. Rabbi Eliezer ben Arach. A good heart has all the rest in them. It's such a beautiful thing, and the same is also with uh, the negative part. What is the worst thing is the bad heart, again, that's the most important. Uh, I just find that to be such a powerful, um, all of it, meaning all of these make sense, to have a good neighbor and to have a good eye. All that is part of it, but when you have a good heart, everything else will uh, stem forth. Um, I also like there's a commentary just on the first word. It's an interesting expression where Rabbi Yochanan, every word is important, Rabbi Yochanan actually starts with the words, go out. He doesn't just say, see what is the good way. He says, go out. So there's a commentary. Um, he says, go out from your setting of your yeshiva walls and find a path that would be appropriate for everyone, not just people on your lofty stature. See what is uh, the right path for everyone. Put yourself in everyone's shoes and um, find a, um, a path that resonates or um, a, um, a purpose that resonates uh, from, from, from everyone's point of view. Um, so a good eye, how would you translate a good eye? Uh, the way the commentary over here says it, a good eye means being generous. Or another way, and this is such a hard trait to have, I was actually at a funeral, unfortunately, several years ago, and uh, the, the um, one of the family members, actually one of the friends said that he was happy in my happy times and talking about the deceased and he was uh, sincerely sad during my difficult times. And that's actually, it took me a while to understand that it was such an incredible um, uh, eulogy, such an incredible memory and uh, um, respect for that person of saying that a true friend is someone who's happy in my promotions and is really sad on, in my sad times, in my difficult times. And that's actually a real friend. And all that is included in Ayin Tova. Or, uh, sorry, that would probably, I guess, be more in, included in Haver Tov. Um, I'm not sure. But I guess it goes together. In a, having a good eye for others or having a good friend. Um, okay, we could go further. And, unless anyone has a commentary on this, but we'll try to squeeze in the last part. Oh, I'm seeing, uh, let me check the chat. Oh, perfect. Yep, Lila Tov Debbie. Um, Vivian, I'm sorry for cutting you off over there. Um, you could continue from Rabbi Eliezer, right? Is that where you're up to? Okay. He says, yep, your friend's honor should be as dear to you as your own honor. So do not become angry easily when he does something wrong, just as you would be patient with yourself. Repent one day before you die. Since you do not know which day will be your last, repent every day. Warm yourself next to the fire of Torah scholars. Keep in close contact with them, but be careful not to become too casual and friendly with them because you might act disrespectfully and be burned by their coals, be punished, because their bite is like the bite of a fox. Their sting is like the sting of a scorpion. Their hiss is like the hiss of a snake, and all their words are like burning coals. Oh, boy. Wow. <laughs> Interesting. Wordy. Yeah. Injuries. Mm -hmm. Does that mean we have to be nice to each other, Rabbi? We're Torah scholars. <laughs> there you go. Um, their hiss is like the hiss of a snake. What an interesting comparison. Um, a fox, a snake. Uh -huh, there's a beautiful commentary here. 
um, he says the uh, teaching of the of the scholars is like a burning coals. So I'm just reading a commentary here from the Midrash Shmuel, who says the teachings of the masters contain both a literal meaning and an inner mystical meaning. The literal meaning is like the fire. It's what you could see. It's what the outside of it is. But then there's a mystical meaning beyond the words. And that's the coal. That's the inside of the flame. And you have to be careful when studying um, to realize that there is an outer meaning and an inner meaning. Um, wow, beautiful. Okay. And the idea of warmth is that you have to realize you have to get close to it in order to feel the warmth. So it's not enough to just enjoy the light of the master um, by learning his teaching from far. You have to be in close proximity to observe not only the teaching, but the style of teaching, the sensitivity in the words, and then you could be warmed up by spiritual uh, life. Let's just try to squeeze in one more. This is a famous one. Uh, many of your mothers or grandmothers or grandparents used the words, ayin kenayin ahora. Anyone heard that expression? So it actually comes from right here, an ayin hara is actually right here in this Mishnah. Ayin hara literally means an evil eye. Don't put an evil eye uh, or a jealous eye is the way he's translating it here. Um, so let's see that one. Uh, let's see, Marsha, uh, Naomi, I, I don't think you had a chance to read yet. Would you like to read one? I'm not sure if you're saying yes or no. You could unmute yourself. There, how's that? Yep, I could hear you now. Okay, I mean, I'm just okay. going to zoom in to make it a little easier for everyone. Go ahead. Number 11. Rabbi Yehoshua says, having a bad, stingy, and jealous eye, fulfilling the temptations of the evil inclination, and hating people for no reason can destroy a person's life and drive him from the world. Is it even possible to hate someone for... <laughs> Thank you, Thomas. It's a beautiful eye. Um... Rabbi Yeshua, so he's very into the eye, right? He, I think in the previous mission, he was talking about having a good eye. Uh, and over here, he's saying the bad eye is what drives a person from the world. What does it mean to uh, hate a person for no reason? Is that even possible? Like, don't you always have a reason? If uh, I mean, hating is not, is not allowed, but uh, what does it mean to hate someone for no reason? I can't understand um, what that means. Maybe for no good reason? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe there is no good reason. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. I think people have imaginary reasons sometimes. They, 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 they project something onto someone else, qualities or something, and, and they hate them for things that really aren't even a part of that person. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a, that's a very nice. Yeah, that's very nice. Thank you. Um, all right. I'll wrap up with the final mission for today. I will do mission of 12. And uh, this is Rabbi Yassi. Yassi is the name of my son. It's a nickname for Yosef but his name is Rabbi Yassi, and he says like this, your friend's money should be as, as dear to you as your own money. Prepare yourself to work very hard for Torah learning because it does not come to you easily and automatically, like an inheritance. So meaning an inheritance comes easily, that you don't have to really earn, you don't have to do anything to earn it other than uh, be related, but... For Torah learning, you have to work on it in order for it to sink in, in order for it, its meanings to resonate, in order to understand it. And finally, all your actions, including your mundane activities, such as eating and sleeping, should be done for the sake of being able to serve God, which means don't separate your life. There's a religious part of me, there's the Jewish part of me, and then there's the other part of me. All of it is one life. All of it is included in, um, in, in my being Jewish, in my serving God. I find that it's, 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 some of this is uh, very powerful. Um, each one of this, I think you could really, um, res you could percolate on and, and understand more. There's more to this chapter, uh, but um, we'll end with that for now. We'll continue again next Thursday. Um, I'm actually preparing a really exciting um, game of Jeopardy that we're going to be playing on Saturday night, right after Shabbat. It will be with Havdalah and a Jewish game of Jeopardy. There's some really good questions um, in the game, and we'll be playing it on this uh, Zoom link, jewishnevada.com forward slash Zoom. It'll be at 8.45, eight, right after Shabbat. So I think Shabbat ends at 8.38, and 8.45 we'll do Havdalah, and a Jewish game of Jeopardy. It should be a lot of fun. 
And tomorrow also we'll do a pre-Shabbat uh, L'chaim together at 7 o'clock. Everyone's welcome to join. It should be a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Um, and oh, one last thing, if anyone would like, I actually got this um, text of Ethics of the Fathers, this Pirkei Avot. I got it as a PDF. So if anyone would like it to prepare, I guess Jolie would like it, absolutely. I'll email it to you. And um, okay, Shira and Thomas, for sure, my pleasure. And that way next week you could prepare, and Adrian as well, sure. It'll be next week on uh, chapter three. Um, you could prepare it if you want, or just have it handy. Um, and Vivian as well, my pleasure. I'll, I'll just email it to everyone with pleasure. And um, I, was, I just got it, and it's, it's a, we have the full book here. Um, it's actually, me- it was meant for children, because it comes with stories and, um, and pictures, but the text itself is actually very, very well written to understand uh, a little bit beyond it. So I'll be happy to share with everyone, and we'll meet again next Thursday for another class on Mishnah and Pirkei Avot. Tomorrow for um, Shabbat, pre-Shabbat, and Saturday night for Abdullah. And finally, we'll wish everyone a Shabbat Shalom and a Chodesh Tov, because tonight begins uh, the month of ER. Tonight is the last day of Nisan, and we go straight into the month of ER, which is an acronym, the letters Aleph, Yud, Yud, Reish, is an acronym for Ani, I, God, Hashem, Rofecha is your healer. It's a promise of God in the Torah that I will be healing you. So the whole month of ER is known to be a month of healing, and may we have a uh, much needed healing for those we know and those we don't know, everyone in the world suffering from COVID-19 or any other illness, we should have the complete healing, uh, God willing, very soon with the coming of Mashiach. So hopefully with the merit of our Torah learning, uh, we're able to accomplish. Uh, Naomi, you're so welcome um, mm-hmm. that we can learn Perkei Avot together. And we'll meet again next week. I'll also be sharing the recording. So if you missed anything um, or if you know anyone that could enjoy it, I'll share that as well. All the recordings of my classes and Adina's classes are all on our website on a very simple link, jewishnevada.com forward slash virtual. So the forward slash Zoom is to get to this classroom. Forward slash virtual is to get to all the recordings of uh, previous classes. All right, thing, Rabbi, oh, Rabbi, just really quickly, I wanted to say how fantastic it is that we can all meet on Zoom. It's very heartwarming to me. And also, Tamar, you're Adina's mom. Oh my God. See, this is such a blessing to have you. I, I, know, I didn't realize that either. Yeah, we love Adina so much. I just want to tell you, she is such a superstar in our community. We love her. And it's such a joy to have you on our meeting. This is like a, kind of like a lucky thing in this bad situation that we get to all meet together. So welcome and thank you for being here. Thank you, Jolie. That was beautiful. And I, I think the same of Adina, of Adina also, Ma. So Tamar, I think uh, Adina is a superstar, too, <laughs> just for the record. <laughs> all right, everyone. Shabbat shalom. Thank you all. Shabbat shalom. 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 Shabbat sh